Family is a good thing. Sorry, it went in. It went in. It went in. That's another thing. Austin, Austin is awesome. Everybody gives you the Austin. Thank you. Thank you. He's a he's a high schooler, and uh, he said he said, Pastor, can I serve? And I said, Sure. And, and he said, Help him do the do the sound, do the set up the camera, um, everything. He even called me and says, Hey, hey, Pastor. And when he's not able to come on Sunday morning, he says, Hey, Pastor, I'm sorry. That I wasn't a, uh, I won't be able to be here this Sunday because I got something going on. Austin, everybody, that, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. If you're not gonna be here on Sunday, let me know. It's okay. I'll still love you and I'll bless you. <laughs> Instead of being like, man, did I not like my joke last week? Did I not cry? <laughs> 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 anyway, I appreciate you, Austin. And, 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 and again, yeah, if you want to serve, let me know. All right, God's good, and uh, we have a word from the Lord, and I took up, or no, I didn't take up, we worship okay. the Lord this morning, so, um, Keep it going. Yeah. right, we're just going to preach, Amen. preach the word. Last, yes. um, last week, <laughs> I had a fun time, oh, pray for the oh, kids, oh, kids, come on up, come on up, kiddos, look at this. I do this. I do this every week. I forgot. I, I just, you know, you know, I'm just mean. I'm just mean. I can't be anybody different. So let's uh, let's bless our kids and, and pray that they would receive the Lord. God, I am so grateful uh, for the kids of Cap City Church that you have blessed us with them being here. God, it's an honor to have kids in church, and God, we pray as they go down the stairs that they would have a ton of fun. And Father, that they would learn about you and the truths that they hear would impact their lives forever. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, guys. You can go have some fun. All right? Have a good time. It's so awesome. It's so quiet. Um, man, we had an awesome time last week. <laughs> we had an awesome time last week talking about divorce. <laughs> you guys know we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and so we've been uh, looking at truth from Jesus, and we've been we've been diving into them. God, we want to receive from you every word. I told people I said as a as a lead pastor, this was. Getting into this topic, I was like, man, that's going to be the first time covering these things. And I was a little nervous about it, but it's all right, because I feel like God has words for all of us again this morning as we continue to look at some passages related to the topic of divorce and marriage, what God's desire is for us, why are these things tough, uh, why are these things spoken against in the Bible. We're going to look into all these things today, uh, but first addressing divorce last week from Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32, Jesus was really specifically uh, getting after people that had begun to use the law for their own selfish gain. They, they, they saw things that were permitted for themselves, and, they, and they, instead of asking how close I could get to God, they searched for how close they could get to the law without breaking it. And I encourage us as a body, whether, uh, whether we're dealing with marriage or we're dealing just with any law of the Lord, any instruction from the Lord, we don't want to see how close we can get to the law without breaking it, but rather how close we can, or, sorry, how close or how much we can love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And this morning, as we continue in this message, or we continue in any instruction from the Lord, that's the, that's the, uh, that, that is the motive that I would like to instill in all of our hearts. Not how close can we get to the law before we break it, but how, how close can we get to God? How much can we love Him with all of our heart, soul, and strength? So today we're going to cover the the unbeliever, uh, the, sorry, the hope for the believer in an unbelieving marriage. As the gospel of Christ continues to go forward in uh, in the New Testament, Jesus comes, he speaks 
Uh, Jesus dies, he rose, it rises again, and then in the book of Acts, we find that the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the believers that are waiting there for the promised Holy Spirit, the power to be a witness, and they begin to go, and the church begins to spread, and rapidly spreads throughout uh, the Jewish culture areas to into all, all areas of the world. And as, this, as the gospel continues to go forth, they become, and they get in contact with other cultures that don't have a Jewish background, don't have this uh, stern law or religious uh, or religious rules that, are, that they're following. They come in contact, the gospel comes in contact with slaves, and it comes in contact with people that have been divorced. It comes in contact with people in unbiblical marriages. It comes in contact with uh, people that are uh, used to worshiping gods through prostitution. And it comes in contact with all these different ideas. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul uh, begins to address some of these things. So if you turn with me, that's going to be the a passage that we will look at for a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So Paul has gone on his missionary journeys to the established churches, and, and, and most of his letters are in, in response. People are uh, having some questions. How do we set up uh, things? Um, how do we answer these problems? Hey, this isn't, uh, we, we aren't sure about this. And so here uh, in chapter 7, verse 1, it says this, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sex relations with a woman. And he, he begins to now address these questions that they have. Paul was not a married man. And so in verse 7, he says this statement. I was like, okay, I'm talking a lot about marriage, a lot of divorce. I know that some, some of us are married in the room. Some of us are divorced, have been divorced in the room. Some of us are single in the room. And what would, what would Paul say to us? Paul in verse 7, he says this, I wish that all of us were like myself. I wish I would have known this verse a while ago. But, you know, maybe would have, Rachel and I would have just served the Lord together passionately, single, um, and saved us a lot of trouble. But I'm glad that God brought us through marriage. And like, man, I can't wait till, not next week, the week after, we're going to tell like amazing story of God's faithfulness to heal and restore relationship. But Paul here, he's like, it, it, he, he encouraged, he, he, he's, he kind of exalts his position of singleness. But why does he do that? Recognize why he does that. We're going to, we're going to read uh, here at the at the end of the message uh, some of the verses that Jesus said. But he says, it, it, if you have less, if you're single, you have less to manage. That's right. You have less to take care of. You can be. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell the end of the sermon. You can be anxious. So as a married couple, you're anxious to take care of your spouse. You're, if you have children, you're anxious to take care of your children. You've got to take care of your children. Children have to have food. i got to take care of my, uh, my spouse. I need them to feel loved. I have, you know, and it says, and this is what Paul says, encouraging. Why does he exalt his singleness? He says, because I, I have less to manage, so what? So I can do more for the kingdom. That's right. Now, it doesn't say, okay, so break up the marriages. This is not what, Jesus, this is not what Paul is This is not what Paul is encouraging. He says, no, when you... When, he, when the gospel's going forward and they had a lot of questions about, hey, if I'm a slave, if, I, if I'm divorced, if I'm in a marriage and, and one person comes to Christ and the other person doesn't, what happened? And he encouraged, no, stay where you're at. Don't like, don't now break off everything so you can go live for the kingdom. Don't do that. Uh, stay married. But he exalts. Where the singles in the room, he exalts that position with the hey, you guys can do a ton for the kingdom of God. Austin can do a ton for the kingdom of God because he, he's a high schooler. <laughs> he, got, he, he don't have to be anxious about anything. Oh, yeah. Let's read verses 12 through 15 and find the encouragement from Paul this morning. Verse 12, it says this, To the rest I say, so this is, um, this, this is, let me, let me go, I'm not going to start with 12, I'm going to start with 10. <laughs> So, uh, again, Paul just encourages himself in, in his singleness in verse 10. It says this, To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from the husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, 
that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such case, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. I'll read that last one again. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, brothers and sisters is not enslaved, because God has called you to peace. Amen. I mentioned this, or alluded to this last week when I was preaching, that uh, oftentimes we have um, scarlet letters that we have in the church. There's some sins that people carry around, and all of a sudden, because somebody has committed a sin, they carry this, uh, like a badge around and this badge of shame or, or, or condemnation. Uh, and, and I believe full-heartedly that no matter what sin you have found yourself in, uh, what sin you have lived through, there is no shame, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And so when I read that last five words in my, in the Bible, God has called you to peace, six, God has called you to peace. Here in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, it refers to the calling of Christ over and over again. That calling to Christ is a calling unto salvation here. And so when he says he has called you to Christ, he's saying, hey, I've called you to uh, forgiveness. I've called you to salvation in Christ Jesus. And he's called us to that relationship in Christ Jesus, that forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus. It's a, it's a, it's a call to peace. No longer who you were. You are now free in Jesus. You're no longer a slave. You are free. You're no longer a bond servant. So now you're a child of God. You no longer live in shame and condemnation because of the things of your life. But now you live in peace with God. Because you have answered the call to Him. Last week we talked uh, about Matthew chapter 5. Specifically about sexual misconduct in marriage. The here we see again an encouragement to stay married even if you are married to an unbeliever. Now when Paul says that, you know, if I'm just in, in my flesh too, I would say as a, as a human, I could I could relate or I could say, hey, that, that I know it's not that road is not easy to stay married even in an un, un, unbelieving marriage. But I'll also make an aside here. And last week I did focus a lot on, on the sexual misconduct within marriage and how that lined up with abuse. And again, saying that was not, God, Jesus was not like uh, giving a, a ultimatum. If, there, if there's some kind of sexual misconduct, okay, divorce is automatic. That was not what Jesus was saying. I also want to give an aside here, or myself, just as Paul did. I read this a few times uh, as I was studying, and in and, and different times, Paul was saying, hey, what I, what I was saying, what God was saying, and, and trying to get this right. I never mentioned last week abuse in marriage, but I want to let you know that I take abuse, even in a marriage context, very seriously, and I believe also that God takes abuse in marriage very seriously. It does not fit my, my understanding of the character of God to force people to stay in marriage when there is abuse happening. And I want to encourage you if you're in the room and you say, hey, there is some serious thing happening in my marriage, that you would seek help and that you would follow the advice of godly counsel around you. God always protects. God always delivers those being taken advantage of. That's his character. And so I, if, again, on the subject of abuse in marriage, I'm not going to cover that fully. I'm not going to get into that at this moment. But I believe that God is the one who brings protection. He brings deliverance. And he always takes care of those being taken advantage of. So I believe in his character that abuse is something in marriage that needs to be taken care of. 
and not permitted. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's specifically talking about the believer who is encouraged to stay in the marriage. That is actually, as a, as a when you come to Christ and, and you, come, you come to Christ, you should actually become a better lover in your marriage than before Christ. And so there is hope here for the marriage here and for the unbelieving spouse when one or the other comes to Christ. Because now in Christ, you have a better example of what love is. As I've mentioned previously, we talked about serving, that Jesus didn't, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he served us even to the point of death. When we think about this in a marriage relationship, when, when we have a, two un unbelievers that have been united in marriage, and then one comes to Christ, and now all of a sudden there's uh, there's animosity in the house, there, there are differences, there are different uh, of opinions, there are different of desires. Well, the one who is in Christ now becomes the stronger spouse, now becomes the one that, that should know how to love because they've received love from Christ. And now it says that by your love, this is what Paul says, right? By your love, you can actually save the spouse. Oh, Andrew, are you teaching that? Hey, that my salvation can be given to Denver or, or my salvation can be given to Rachel? No. But I believe that through our marriage and through our relationship and through the love that we show as believers in a, in a marriage, that, that, that my love that I've received from Christ and now shown to my spouse can save my spouse. Don't give up. Be like Jesus, Paul, who's encouraging the, the married couple. Be like Jesus. Even if, it, even if it looks terrible, even if the, your spouse is an unbeliever, if they don't follow after Jesus, it doesn't matter. Be like Jesus. Don't give up. Love like He loves. Because when we love like He loves, then that love that we receive from Christ penetrates their heart and we may save our spouse. Verse 15, again, I repeated this earlier, but if the unbelieving spouse separates, let it be so. In such case, the brother or sister is not enslaved. We're not enslaved. God has called us to peace. Now in Christ, we are free of the Let's read verse 25, uh, 25 through uh, 40 this morning. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgments. As one who is the Lord's mercy is trustworthy, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Don't seek for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if you are betrothed a woman married, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning. Those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy, though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealing with it. For the present from this world is passing away. What is Paul instructing us here in, in this encouragement to us as married, as single, as engaged, as divorced, as, uh, as divorced, or in an uh, unbelieving marriage? What he's, he's encouraging is that the time is short when the Lord is coming back. This message begins here and it continues even now. The time is short before the Lord is coming back. Don't, don't get involved in, uh, or engage in worldly things. Don't, don't bar burden yourself with more responsibility than is necessary. The Lord is coming back. And what does uh, he continue to say here? We'll continue reading. The Lord is coming back. It's, it's time to live for his kingdom. In verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about things the Lord, about the things of the Lord, 
how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or the betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in the body and the spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his patrol, let me stop at verse 35 for a second. But I say that for your own benefit, not to lay a restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. You guys will see as the series continues, I've, uh, I've encouraged us, hey, I wanted to speak all four of these messages before we have time in our in our missional communities. We've been discussing water baptism. Before we, uh, before we study and discuss uh, this, these scriptures on, on marriage. Because um, we'll see how all these last five messages, all the messages from the, uh, all, all the messages from the Sermon on the Mount and these messages about marriage, all will come to accumulation when we get to the last message in this series. Because of this specific verse here, uh, I say that anyone whose own benefit may not lay any restraint upon it, but promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. As we talk, as we begin to talk over the next couple of weeks about marriage, what does marriage look like in Christ? That Christ, that we would have the same love for each other as Christ does for the church. That we, as a married couple, a few weeks ago we talked about satisfying. That Jesus is the only one that satisfies. In a marriage, in a, in a uh, sorry, in a marriage, a husband and a wife married together, covenant forever. The goal of the marriage is not to satisfy each other's desires. The hard thing here that that we get mixed up every once in a while is that that all of a sudden we're looking for each other's uh, each other's responses, each other's needs, uh, trying to meet each other's needs. But we were never meant to meet each other's needs. Even here, Paul encourages us that we should have what undivided devotion. To the Lord. How do you have a strong marriage? How do you have a, a, a great marriage? Is it that, hey, that I serve Rachel and give Rachel everything she needs? Well, no, it's an understanding. I can't give Rachel everything she needs. But with both of us having our undivided devotion to the Lord, then we serve each other, not out of obligation to meet each other's needs, but out of the outflow of what we've received from the Lord. If anyone, let's continue, verse 36, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, he is that passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do so as he wishes, let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined that this is in his heart to keep her as a control, he will do well. So then he who marries is betrothed does not or does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Paul, if you remember, Paul says at the beginning of all of this, he says, I, I, I'm speaking, this. I, I'm passionate about this. Paul is passionate, and I believe the Lord is passionate about us having uh, freedom to serve the Lord in everything that we have. So again, if we read this, we're like, oh, the single people would be like, yeah, I got a one-up. And the married people are like, oh, oh no, he's speaking against me. No. Either way, in verse 38, that whether he's married or he chooses not to marry, they do good. They do well. There is no sin in it. 39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only if, only in the Lord. Yet in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Here. Paul's pretty, pretty happy about the fact that I have no restraints. I have no anxieties outside of just doing what the Lord wants me to. You can get married. But no, I think I'm pretty good. And I think the Spirit of God is good with us having the freedom to serve Him. No restraint, nothing holding back, no other anxieties, no other worries. All have the freedom to marry, but consider how you can do greater things for God in your single state. 
Paul uses the word anxious to describe our desires. Married is anxious to care for the needs of the family, to care for the needs of the spouse. And the singleness is a gift that allows you to be anxious about less and leaving room for you to be anxious about the kingdom of God. As I was studying this subject of divorce, marriage, singleness, marriedness, where does God desire all these things to be? Why does the marriage become such a beautiful picture of Christ and the church? I was reminded of a saying and something that has brought condemnation, fear, and shame on many who have walked through divorces in their lives. And, and this one saying, it says, uh, has been repeated in church over and over again. Even as I was searching uh, scriptures and searching articles and researching this message, I would see this over and over again repeated, that God hates divorce. I want to look together at Malachi chapter 2. Have the ESV. I like the ESV. It matches. Malachi chapter 2, we're going to read verse 14 through 16. Why does divorce grieve the heart of God? Why do we say so often in church God hates divorce? Malachi chapter 2, verse 14 through 16 this morning, it says this, But you say, why does he not because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of your none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife, but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments with violence, since the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit, and do not be faithless. Guard yourselves in your spirit, and do not be faithless. As I was looking through the scriptures and I was trying to find out where do we see this, uh, where do we get this saying in the church, God hates divorce. As I mentioned last week, and I, I am fair to admit, I am no Hebrew scholar. I couldn't qualify to interpret Hebrew and Greek. However, as we study, we see all the different versions. Why I had had changed to NIV or the ESV here? It was split down the middle. Which versions uh, interpret this that God in verse sixteen for the man for in ESV? Sorry, in ESV it's written for the man who hates his wife divorces her, and, and then it's split down the middle whether that's interpreted the man who hates his wife or that God. Uh, or sorry, or that God hates divorce. That many are interpreted, I hate divorce. Others are interpreted, the man who hates his wife divorces her. Either way this morning, we're going to see that divorce is not God's intent for the married man and woman. 
Why is that? Because something that we've declared this morning over and over again already was the faithfulness of God, His character. What is sin? What, what makes something sin? What does, there's a list of sins that are found in Scripture that God hates certain things, God finds certain uh, acts um, that are detestable to Him, lying is put in there, not obeying, not honoring your mother and father is listed in some of those, those things, uh, homosexuality, divorce, um, adultery, orgies, also there's hatred, but what makes sin, why is sin, why, is, why are those things uh, sin? Why are those things considered something God hates? Why are those things considered something against God's character? Try to get away in the last one. Is it because God is some holy, uh, strong, uh, authoritative person that says, you can't do these things and this is the law and that's it? Or was God's purpose and intent in creating us? That he created us in his image to bear his character, to be an example of his glory and his character in all the world. And every time we do something like this, divorce here in Malachi chapter 2, it goes against the character of God. It doesn't display, as we declared already so many times this morning, He is faithful. Malachi chapter 2, so guard yourself in your spirit and do not be faithless. Do not break your covenant. You've been, you've been wed, you've been married, you've been betrothed to the, it says here specifically talking about a husband to his spouse, of his wife, of his youth. Right? And you have broken your covenant. You have hated her. You have divorced her. And you've covered yourself with violence. You have become unfaithful. Sin is any time that we fail to exhibit the character of God. How do I know that this is that faithfulness? is a key to this subject of divorce and what angers God so much. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, it says this, So then, if they are no longer two, but one, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. The picture of marriage, as we'll talk about in the next two, two sermons in this series, the picture of marriage is a marriage that represents who Christ is to the church. The book of Hosea is a crazy book to read and to understand God's character. Last week I had mentioned that though there is, though there seems to be a, a permission for divorce for those who uh, are in marriages that there have been unfaithfulness in their sexual relations. Uh, Hosea is a whole book of a story of why or, or, or the character of, of God towards us and the church. I love it when I'm, uh, when I'm speaking from uh, chapters and speaking of stories that people in the church are familiar with because when they, because as I'm speaking, you guys are already knowing where I'm heading. Hosea, a prophet, a man of God, a representation of, of God to his people, is instructed to marry an unfaithful woman. Last week I talked about, uh, I mentioned, hey, if it's unfaithful once, you know, hey, the, if we're really studying the, the Greek and we really get into the word type of thing, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't talking about a, a one-time one occurrence, it was talking about a continual occurrence of unfaithfulness in their sexual relations within the marriage. Uh, here we, we see the story of Hosea uh, and the 
unfaithful woman continues, continues, and continues unfaithfulness in the marriage. And what was God's message to his people? One, and specifically, he goes, you are that unfaithful woman. I've made a covenant with you, and I've been faithful to you over and over and over and over again, and, and you broke the covenant over and over and over again, but I've been faithful to you, 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 and still to this moment, to the next moment, to the last moment, he's been faithful to us, he's been faithful to us, he's been faithful to us. God hates anything that does not reflect his character. Whether that be lying, stealing, murder, or all the other lists of sin in scripture. But specifically when we're talking about divorce, he, it, it grieves the heart of God because it separates something that was meant to be a covenant forever. Just as Christ's covenant with his church is forever. Again, we find that in Malachi chapter 2, God focuses not specifically on the divorce, rather the focus is on the way in which the spouse's hate and separation breaks the commitment to faithfulness that God has through his church. So, pastor, is there any hope? Pastor, I, I'm in that boat. I am the divorced. I am the divorcee. Paul's words remain the same to each one of us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. That we are free. That God desires those who he calls. He desires to give freedom. He desires to give peace to us. Whether it was one of the sins listed, whether it's uh, whether it was divorce, the topic that we're covering even now, there is freedom from all guilt and all shame and all condemnation in Christ Jesus. He desires to give us peace. Yeah. He desires to make us whole. But in response to this message, we do have to examine our hearts. Maybe. There's, in this room, we need to receive peace from God, that he's restored our soul to him. I would say some in this room need to examine your faithfulness to God. What is sin? Anything that doesn't, <clears throat> any expression that doesn't allow us to meet the character of God. If you're in a relationship this morning and there's brokenness, you're married to an unbeliever and you're praying for them on a regular basis and they will come to know Christ, man, I am, want to be with you, Rich, and I want to be with you, walking with you, praying with you, cheering you on to continue your faithfulness to God and to the covenant that you made so that God may heal or restore or bring peace or salvation to the heart of your spouse. I also believe this morning that God wants to release us from shame. So I want to pray with you this morning, and I ask that you would respond in this way. One, examine your heart. Is there any unfaithfulness in me? Is there any way that I have been unfaithful to God, and so I need forgiveness because I have failed to live up to the character of who God is? Two, you may be in the room and you have shame in your heart. You have, uh, you have condemnation in your heart because of relationships that have been broken, divorces in your life. And I believe with all my heart that the same God that called you to salvation, he wants to call you to freedom and to peace this morning. Third, if you need prayer, you need some encouragement because you're in a marriage right now and you say, you know what, uh, I, I need salvation. I need to believe for salvation. My, my spouse needs to receive from God, needs to receive peace from God as well. And how, Rachel and I, we want to join you in prayer. We want to stand with you. We want to cheer you on because we believe wholeheartedly, you guys will feel our testimony in two weeks, that God is a God that brings restoration. Yeah. Always. Always. Yes. 
There's always hope. And why do I say that, man? We'll, we'll, we'll share our story too. I keep on saying that. I want to share it all now. Like, let's say it. Man, I had somebody that looked me in the eye and said, man, in the gospel, there is hope. And I said, of course, I know that. I can preach that message. He said, no. In the gospel, there is hope for every situation. If there wasn't, Jesus would have stayed in the grave. But because Jesus rose from the grave, we can have hope no matter what we're facing, no matter what the situation is. There can be restoration. There can be hope. There can be forgiveness. There, it can be set right. So if you need that, Rachel and I will join you in prayer and say, hey, we're going to believe for hope and restoration in your marriage. We're going to believe hope and restoration in your spouse that needs to come to Jesus. And we're going to believe that as a church, we're going to be faithful to who God is. We're going to be faithful to his character. And we're going to live righteously like he, that he designed us and desires for us. Let's pray this morning and then respond. Father, I thank you for your truth and your word, God. And sometimes it's, it's hard to speak like you. Because God, I, oh, it's tough words to speak and just declare. But Father, I know that you desire our marriages to be whole. Father, so they can reflect your character full. Father, I pray for any pain and any shame and any condemnation that may exist in hearts today. Father, that, that would be released to you. And Father, that they would find wholeness, healing, and hope in you this morning. Father, as we respond to you, I, I pray that if we find unfaithfulness in our heart, God, that we would repent of that and be made whole. Father, if we have unbelieving spouses, Father, Lord, that we would have hope, Father, for their salvation. Father, that we would love them as you have loved us. Father, if we find ourselves in a, in a broken relationship, Father, Lord, and divorced this morning, God, I pray, Father, Lord, that the shame and condemnation will be released. And, Father, that we would receive peace that you give us when you call us to wholeness. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.